Hello, hello, and welcome to Mixed with the Wild. I'm Austin. Here we have AJ Lightheart, and we from the Wild are so happy to have you here today talking about a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts, probably something that's been buzzing for you as well with all the craziness of seeing the metaverse popping up a lot. Today we're talking about choosing the right VR headset for your AEC team. Today's focus is going to be specifically for using this emerging technology for your architecture, engineering, construction team, and how it applies to really enhancing the workflows of working smarter, saving time, and being able to just connect your clients into better experiences. Who are we? Who are these guys standing in front of you talking about VR? We're the Wild, and we own two products, the Wild and Iris VR, Prospect by Iris VR. These are two products that serve the entire design to construction spectrum, all the way from taking your idea in ideation with the wild of prototyping, creating immersive presentations, and even being able to use augmented reality and how that carries over into Prospect by Iris VR. This is a little more focused on design reviews, immersive issue tracking, and better tools for BIM coordination and large model loading. We're not here to talk about these products today. What we're really here to talk about is what it takes to get into immersive experiences for your AEC team. This is not focused on gaming. We're not gonna be focused on many other applications other than design and building collaboration and coordination. So to kick this off, because this is probably a topic that has been very relevant to you. If you're showing up here, chances are you're VR curious. So what we wanna do is get a chance to understand what exactly is a hesitation or question you have about adopting VR for your firm? What is the number one hesitation holding you back? For some of you, it might be just a stigma with virtual reality as it might seem focused on gaming. Some people it might be the cost involved and not understanding what sort of costs there are to scale this. Or maybe it's just not an understanding of the ROI for getting your leadership teams buy off. Whatever it is, just do a one word sentence. We're gonna take a look at these and kind of assimilate this into the conversation that we're guiding today as it relates to your specific journey. But in the meantime, as you fill out that question, it is my delight to introduce you today, our other host, AJ Lightheart, AEC Immersive Technology Consultant at The Wild. AJ has been an emerging technology leader in the AEC industry for the past 11 years. As a trusted advisor for SMB to ENR top 500 companies, AJ has consistently found a passion for connecting technology to a practical ROI. Outside of consulting, AJ loves trying new craft beers and trying to keep up with his boys. AJ, so great to have you here today. I know this is a topic that is something you're very passionate about and very experienced with if you've, as you've scaled this technology to so many companies. So AJ, thank you for being here. No, of course, Austin. Uh, again, you're you are a host here too. You deserve as much credit for uh, our session here today. But it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all. Uh, for me this morning, but wherever you're at, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are once again very humbled to have people join us from all throughout the world, and want to make sure that this is a very beneficial use of your time. It's such an important topic. I mean, such a key ingredient of bringing VR as a part of your integrated BIM workflow. And we really want to know where you're at in your journey. Drop that in the chat. Let us know where you're, where you're joining us from here today. Let us know questions you have as we're gonna have a part of our session dedicated to Q&A at the end. And also let us know other topics that you would be interested for us to cover in Mix. This was actually a topic. This specific one was a suggestion in one of our webinars months back. So if there's other topics really on top of the brain, please do drop that in there and it very well might become a Mix session in the coming months. But as Austin said, you know, as the focus of our session today, really helping you think through the considerations, items to take into account so your team can deploy the right headset or headsets to really support what you're looking to accomplish. And I want to be very, very clear on you know, what this session is here today. One, nothing in here is proprietary, okay? You, you could go out to Google and do all this searching and probably consolidate and get all this information together. But our goal, our charter was to curate it 
consolidate it all down to you to save you time and research effort so you can have an actionable plan and guide that will allow you to get right to more of the fun stuff versus the burdensome research. Now, I, I also want to um, highlight, I know that AR, augmented reality, is most certainly a topic on a lot of people's minds as well. Ours as an organization too. We are gonna be focusing on VR goggles and headsets today, but augmented reality very well will probably be a topic for us in the upcoming months as well. So I think one of the best place for us to start, Austin, maybe just to, to kick it off of helping the group understand what options are even available to them today. Excellent question, AJ. Great place to start. And also, I'd like also like to go throw out to Ronald. Thank you for throwing that question in the Q&A section as programs to assist yes. in developing VR models. We would encourage anyone else who's attending. Uh, see, we've got a great attendance. Alex, Brian, Darren, Malcolm. Yes, Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining in today. <laughs> Please feel free to throw your questions in that Q&A as we'll address it later today. But to address AJ's first question of what is available today in 2022. Right now, we're gonna give you a general overview of some of the hardware that's available today. You've probably seen a lot of these devices change, honestly, on a quarterly basis. You may have seen Oculus change to Meta. Pico has all of a sudden put out this new headset in the past, and it's a lot to keep up with. So what we're gonna do is introduce the landscape, then teach you a little bit more about the comparative differences here. Yes. But for today and Q2-ish of 22, you have the MetaQuest 2, the Pico Neo 3 Pro, the HP Reverb G2, the Valve Index, and the Vive Pro 2. These are some of the top contenders of VR headsets that we're seeing a lot of companies similar to yourselves using today. But we'll get a little bit more into the differences between these, these here in a second. Before that though, AJ, yeah. there's a lot of terminology involved with these headsets. So sure. can you walk us through some of these terms and how to understand their key differences? Yeah, most definitely. And let me just say to your to your prior slide there, Asa, I mean, it's so great seeing how many different options are available on the market to, today. Gone are the days where it's one option, you're pigeonholed to that. For us, that's a real sign that the industry is embracing this technology and that will only continue to move up in the right to, uh, to the correct direction. But when you are thinking about uh, VR headsets, there are a lot of terminology that sometimes I have seen gets pushed to the side when it really can be important to understand, dependent again on the use case of what you're looking to accomplish. And these are just a few, there's, there's certainly many more, but some of the key ones that we want to make sure we can break down into a very digestible, understandable way as it will prove valuable to you. So let's just go ahead and start on the top of the list here, tracking. So there's two main ways that VR headsets are accomplishing tracking, outside in and inside out. And let's unpack each of those a bit. So for a long time, outside in was the only tracking. Uh, a mechanism, way to accomplish. And what outside in is, is when you're in a fixed environment, like I'm you know, in my small office here, I would have uh, other pieces of technology, base stations or lighthouses fixed throughout the environment. And those are the sensors that are then pushing back to the headset. So as you can hear, outside in does take some, a little bit more set up some other technology in the environment you're in, for that tracking to become available, but it does give a higher level of accuracy. And for some individuals, they feel like it does allow them to feel more immersed in the experience. So outside in. Inside out, as we have started to see more and more new headsets enter the, the market, like the MetaQuest 2 uh, and the Pico Neo 3, these headsets have sensors or cameras on the devices themselves. So inside out. The positive of that is you don't need to have these base stations or lighthouses, so a little less setup, tracking and accuracy, not as tight as inside out, but still can create a very, very good experience. So to summarize what I'm hearing, AJ, outside in, more hardware involved, a little more setup, yep. but it's more accurate if we need those precise movements in VR. And then the inside out, the cameras are built into the device, super easy to set up, 
not quite as accurate, but for a lot, the trade-off is worth the convenience of just being able to plug and go. Very well said. Absolutely cool. correct. Okay. So that's our tracking. Let's get a little more into what we're actually seeing in the VR headsets. What are the differences there? Yeah, most definitely. So again, starting at the top field of view, or you might hear um, FOV. So field of view in its most simple way to think about it, and just let's think about it in real life. As humans, we traditionally have roughly about 180 degrees field of view. Different headsets will have different field of views, you know, more or less. So that's how much of the picture you're going to be seeing. So certainly, uh, again, depending on the, the, the use case that you have at hand, that field of view is very well something you're going to want to take into consideration. Resolution, simplest way of saying it, how crisp, how clean is the image? How uh, lifelike is it going to be? Certain headsets uh, like the, you know, the Valve Index or some of the, count, uh, the tethered ones like the Windows HP Reverb G2 do a fantastic job of having very strong resolution, thus can create a much crisper uh, image that you're experiencing. And finally, refresh rate, best way to say it, the smoothness. As you're rotating your head, how well is it tracking with you? Uh, how well is it not feeling like it's like lagging its way around. So that refresh rate and that smoothness does become very important when you, uh, you hear people feeling like they're, they get nauseous in headset, a better refresh rate, people are finding that that lowers that feeling of, of, of nauseousness, thus very important element for you to take into consideration as well. And, and not to scare anyone off on this call, AJ, mostly some of the older VR headsets is where we saw that effect. Now so, it's common for most headsets to have a refresh rate of 90 hertz or above, which is pretty standard. But some of those older experiences were more like a stop motion experience. VR is getting much more comfortable for a lot of people. And when you are thinking about the resolution, even on this image here, this is an example of the difference of how we see the crispness of those details. With the HP Reverb G2 over here, you can see a marked difference in the clarity of the numbers that are coming in. And now with the HTC, or excuse me, the Vive Pro 2, we have an even higher resolution availability. So these are things to think of if the type of work you're bringing in is perhaps Revit stickers with really high fidelity information, yes. and you need to make sure people can see that having high resolution is very important. Most definitely. All right, so we got an understanding of what it looks like in there, but what about how we're actually getting the experiences onto the headset? What is the difference between tethered and standalone? Yes, probably one of the first questions I always get asked about uh, tethered versus untethered or, or, or standalone. So uh, again, let's unpack each of these individually. So tethered, uh, as the name implies, is you truly are connected or tethered to another device, namely your laptop or your workstation machine. This is the likes of a uh, Valve Index or a Windows uh, Reverb G2. So the positive of that is you are harnessing the processing power of that machine, not just being reliant on the headset itself. Potential downside, you could say, is that you are connected to a machine. So your range of motion, uh, possibility of getting tangled up with the cord, not being as portable, does become potentially the give and take of that dynamic. But again, as we think through the use cases you have at hand, which we will be talking a little bit more about here momentarily, the tethered option for certain use cases is a very, very uh, powerful one for you to accomplish what you're looking, looking for. On the other side of the coin, we have standalone or untethered. And this is really going to likely be the norm upcoming as new headsets are entering the market. You know, the MetaQuest 2, Pico Neo 3, and as new ones enter the space too. And as the name implies, you are fully working off the processing power of that headset itself. No need to be tied to another piece of machinery um, or um, you know, device. So it does give you much more portability, much more free range of motion. So it really can be a positive approach if you're gonna be on the road a lot um, and really looking for some greater flexibility on that front. And actually one thing I want to note too on the tethered piece is that 
you know, depending on which headset you're looking at, you also may need to make sure that the other infrastructure or hardware you have in play is up to VR ready specs. So if someone on our team in the chat could drop in our getting started guide of just like recommended VR ready computers, that also very much can become a key ingredient in this recipe for a tethered option as well. And just to reemphasize that point you made, AJ, is the fact that these newer standalone devices do have the hybrid ability to optionally Good be point. tethered physically, or in some cases, wirelessly, if you have a solid internet speed. And a lot of teams are finding that that hybrid approach works great to have flexibility to be on the go, but still stream larger resolution experiences onto the devices. Yeah, cool. great. Okay, so that makes sense in terms of tethered versus standalone, but what about what we're actually doing in these experiences? And I think this kind of speaks to the question James Lucero put in the chat, by the way, is thinking of VR charrettes what are these experiences that we could do on both and what sort of software should we be thinking of for them? Yes, yes. You know, after I've talked with an organization about some of the um, you know, terminology and really just what options are out there, then it comes down to two other key considerations. How, you know, what are we going to be using it for and where? We'll talk about where in a second. Let's start on the how side. So when we look at what organizations are looking to deploy VR for, we see really uh, five top, top use cases. Early stage charrettes and prototyping, like pinup boards, war room types of environments, um, you know, bids and proposals, heavy coordination, issue tracking, uh, client renderings, visualizations. You know, those are some of the, the, the key ones that we're consistently seeing. And dependent on that, you're going to likely have different needs in terms of processing power, you know, frame rate, visualization. So let's start on the front end of things. If you're an organization that is really looking to deploy VR in like a charrette, early stage prototyping, really an ideation types of environment, you're likely going to be bringing in experiences that aren't fully baked, they're not federated, not a whole lot of in-depth geometry. So your processing power needs are going to be on the lower end of the spectrum. That's where the likes of a Pico Neo 3, a MetaQuest 2, again, one of those standalone untethered options, even with their processing power just through the headset itself, will give you more than enough you need to bring those use cases to life. But if we're looking more at, uh, as that, uh, the, the video on the right there highlights, heavier models, very federated, linked, different disciplines, and really for coordination and constructability, you're likely going to want to look at potentially harnessing the processing power of a tethered headset and working through your, your machine so that it can bring on all those minute details and potentially to have that resolution that you need to really dissect the topic up closely that potentially uh, some of its standalone or untethered options just would not be able to bring to the table. So very, very much encourage you to think about what are the use cases you're looking to deploy that can be a great North Star in helping you decipher which headsets you might want to focus your attention around. And just to visualize that of what those priorities are for the people in the call here, AJ, is this recent poll we launched. Yeah. What essential uses of VR? Uh, we have 74% who need to include design collaboration of some sort. That right. is where you probably want to, would want to use an experience such as the wild for that charrette prototyping experience. Building coordination, that's where it's optional to have a great tether uh, to be able to load some of those federated models. And then as we get to the bottom, it is still good to think about our overall XR strategy for our company in terms of what other experiences we're using for these devices, whether it's training, simulation, or even in some instances, the ability to have recreation of some sort to get people comfortable moving in VR and excited about the uses. These do, can, these do affect the considerations of what headsets we get into. As we'll get into a little more detail, as we'll dissect that chart of what options are available for all of these uses. Yes. All right, so AJ, we've got the how, but what about where? Where are we using these headsets and how does it affect our usage, especially as we're seeing a lot of different distributed and hybrid work teams? Oh, isn't that the truth? Yeah, I mean, this question would have really been a completely moot point if you would have asked me you know, three years ago, really 
for that matter. One, a global pandemic hadn't hadn't uh, entered the picture yet. And two, a lot of these new headset options weren't available. At that time, everyone was primarily in the office. But we've certainly now seen more so than ever the work from home dynamic and the remote workforce. How are we going to empower them? And how does that relate to technology considerations like this? So if I'm talking with an organization and their team is primarily dispersed, you know, working from home uh, like I am, or they're going to be on the road a lot, taking, wanting to have this be a part of their trade shows or the bid or the proposals, it's going to be very challenging, not undoable to use a tethered option. As we talked about earlier, you're going to have to have your, your high powered machine or laptop with you. You might have to take some base stations. Not again, undoable, but probably unrealistic to make that a repeatable process of that flexibility, the nimbleness. If you're gonna be on the road a lot and, 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 and in the move in transit, an untethered option is going to be your best bet. However, if you are primarily you know, working from one single environment, and that could even be your home office too, right? I mean, there's no reason if you're primarily in a home office, you couldn't have a tethered option with your base stations, get that one-time setup out of the way, will give you the benefit of that better tracking and, and horsepower. Um, but two, if you're an organization that is getting back into the office, a lot of firms are trying to um, pick up a project that they started years ago of having a dedicated VR environment. That's where a tethered option very well may be the best option for you. And actually on that note, Austin, again, we are seeing firms get back into the office more and a lot of organizations are trying to build out a dedicated VR environment, oftentimes called a cave, some people are probably familiar with that, but maybe you could speak to a bit of what that is and why it might be a consideration point for them as well. VR cave sounds scary. <laughs> uh, to me, it raises the imagery of Doritos and Mountain Dew, but that is surprisingly not the case. This is actually a term that is being embraced by a lot of these companies who are creating dedicated work spaces specifically for virtual reality. We see a lot of our colleagues, peers, customers using these for example, with Mortensen on the left of how they've created a cutting edge room that has high visibility as they bring in high VIP customers, collaborators, as a place for other people to visualize the experience with multiple panels, plenty of space to, root, to walk around and move throughout their 3D models. And then another instance on the right, as you see what McDonald Miller has done is creating an immersive room that actually projects the experience. So it feels like someone who can stand in there doesn't have to be in VR as well. Just a couple of options to provide some inspiration of how this is really becoming a standard fixed workstation for virtual reality at the office. Yeah, yeah, mo most definitely. And one of the things I would just add to as I'm starting to see firms start to build out their, their VR you know, workstations or, or caves a bit more is that I think it's important to have both spectrums present, have some untethered, have some dedicated. If this is going to be a space where you want your employees, your team to come to, you wanna make sure that you have the technology available to accommodate whatever the use case and scenario is at hand. And believe me, I get that firms, we all don't have unlimited funds to you know, have anything and everything, but I would say if possible, have some untethered, have some tethered, that's gonna give you the best spectrum of accommodating the totality of where this fantastic technology could be a part of your process. Perfect. So now what we have up here is a sheet as a comparison chart of a really detailed overview of some of these specs we've talked about between these headsets. There's a couple of things that we have to share in terms of summarizing these as what the pros and cons of each are, but these are those generally recommended headsets that we're seeing today in 2022. And AJ, I think you, you, uh, you mentioned earlier, you had one other question on security, right? That's something that we're hearing a lot about from a lot of these. Yeah, companies. yeah, no, I mean, certainly um, understanding the security requirements and how this can play into a firm's uh, decision of which options might be correct for them. I know, Austin, you have some good insight on some pieces that play yeah. into that, that will be helpful okay. to the group. Of course, as we're considering adopting new hardware, security is the number one consideration we need to be thinking of 
in terms of how it affects our overall device strategy. As we look on this chart over here, you'll notice that some of these prices, which we'll also get into some of the price comparison momentarily, some of these have a little briefcase next to them that indicates that there's an enterprise option available. These typically are more expensive if it's an alternate version from their consumer headset, but usually it means it complies with enterprise standards of being secure and having the ability to be deployed using a multi-device manager. What is a multi-device manager? Chances are it's something that your IT team is very keen on using. It's basically a way of scaling and having a strong understanding of what devices are in your company's fleet. Uh, they can install different apps on it. They can check security provisions, but it's very important for firms that are thinking of on a widespread basis, bringing software into there, they need to have this enterprise option. And you'll notice that there is not currently an enterprise option available for the MetaQuest 2. Originally, there was a program called Oculus for Business that has since closed and is on hold until later this year, where they will be creating, as, as told, the MetaQuest for Business program that allows similar security provisions. On that note, however, we do have to mention the facts that right now, if you're on the market today with this consumer headset as the only option, it is currently required to be linked to a Facebook account in order for you to access the store to get apps on there or to use other private apps. So that is an important consideration for a lot of companies who may not want that their, their private work is linked to a Facebook account. We have been told that at some point in 2022, the Facebook account will be decoupled and no longer required. But until then, it's important to be considering this as you're looking at your headset options. And in terms of how that compares to the different headsets on the, on the market, the Pico Neo 3 Pro is a fantastic option for that flexibility of being able to be standalone as well as optionally tethered at a pretty reasonable mid price point of an enterprise grade headset. So a lot of considerations there with security. Um, as always, feel free to follow up with more questions on those. But until then, what we're going to do is just basically do a synopsis of all these headsets, how they stack up against each other. And in the meantime, I would also like to encourage you to fill out this interactive poll for yourself as a way of ranking objectively on a piece of paper, what, are, what of these traits are the most important for us in terms of how we're using it at our company? This is a way for you to rank and then find the best match for you. As you fill that out, and we go through this list, we'll go ahead and start with the MetaQuest 2. This is a great standalone headset that has an optional tether. It is currently one of the most affordable headsets on the market right now. However, it is required to be linked to a Facebook account to be used. It has pretty standard resolution and somewhat decent field of view and comfort. Next on the list is the Pico Neo 3 Pro. This is a fantastic enterprise option headset with the ability to optionally wirelessly tether and also be controlled using a multi-device manager. It's a little heavier, but arguably more comfortable due to the counterweight of the headset in the back. And it also has pretty standard field of view, refresh rate and resolution. Next up on the list is the HP Reverb G2. This is a solid mid-tier, mid-priced tethered headset that does require that PC that we were talking about to have the experience. Relatively comfortable weight, a slightly wider field of view, and then 90 refresh rate, but a pretty solid resolution as well for more details. Next on the line is the Valve Index, which was originally a more game-focused headset, but it does have a fantastic field of view. You'll notice that it's one of the widest here that provides more peripheral vision view, as well as one of the highest refresh rates, which provides a smoother experience. This starts at, at $1,000, and it, again, is required to be tethered and have the base stations. The highest resolution headset available is the Vive Pro 2, and you'll notice that it also has 120-degree field of view, which is fantastic, but it's one of the heaviest headsets on this list. It's a little more heavyweight. It has some padding available, uh, but this starts at $1,400 or $1,600 for the enterprise option. And if that's a little too expensive for you, the Vive Pro is still available for purchase today as well. A little cheaper, but not quite as great specs. So now that we've answered that poll, I'm gonna share these answers with you here as a way of just kind of showing what's on everyone's minds for these priorities. As we think about what, what sort of headsets we need to be considering for ourselves using these. 
Um, I want to invite you as you're thinking through this to drop any final Q&A you have as we're about to get to our Q&A section. Uh, until then, I do want to extend it over to AJ. Do you have any closing thoughts on what we've looked at with this comparative headset, considerations people need to be having, and how we can take this conversation to the next level? Yeah, no, I mean, this, uh, this guide has been a, a real labor of love for us in many ways that we can best inform our prospective customer base. And you know, I think the, the weight, I'm glad you mentioned that, Austin, the weight is certainly a piece to take into consideration. Uh, though the counterbalance on most of them do a good job, you will very much notice feeling yourself getting pulled around uh, a, a little bit more. And, you know, just speaking from personal experience too, I've had the pleasure of interacting with almost all the headsets on this list. And let me just say there's, there truly is no real right or wrong answer. You know, let the use case, let the where or the how really dictate which options you might want to have. Now I was in San Francisco on, on Wednesday. I knew I was going to be on the road. The MetaQuest 2 was perfect for me. But when I was in, in our office in the past, the Vive or the Vive Pro with the lighthouses was fantastic because we had the space to set it up. So be open-minded, use what we've covered today as a checklist, almost like a scorecard to help you identify and prioritize which one or ones are right for you. As we're getting into the Q&A, again, encourage you to drop any of those questions in the Q&A section, just kind of talking through what you've ranked as most essential for these headsets. It looks like we have privacy as one of the top essential pieces of when you're considering a headset, closely followed by performance and immersion. Next up, in terms of very important, we see that performance is next highest, and then as well as portability and immersion. So we work our way down to this. This is just good to see what your peers in the industry are considering as well. Uh, but keep this in hand as you're making this very important decision of what headset to get into. All right, time for Q&A, AJ. Let's see what people are on people's minds. Absolutely. We're going to start by going down the list. Number one, starting with Ronald Coons. Please I apologize if I pronounced it incorrectly, but Ronald's question was, insight into programs to assist in developing good VR models. AJ, do you have any expertise to share in terms of what you've found client success with this? Yeah, and I think, Ronald, the, uh, the question is, you know, before we bring a model into VR, where should we be doing that? And what are some best practices of keep creating a repeatable process? Um, I, that's how I'll speak to it. If not, feel free to, to chime in. I'll be happy to follow up with you after. But we see our customer base bringing in models from a number of different sources. Revit, Navis work, SketchUp, Rhino. Again, we want to make sure we have a lot of different avenues for customers. And the key things, especially if you're going to be bringing in a model of any scale, is being open-minded, potentially doing some section boxing, and also thinking through, are there any categories or materials, geometry, that is really unnecessary for the end use case of what we're looking to accomplish, any things that you can slightly tone back, especially, especially, especially if you are gonna be using an untethered or a standalone option, are going to create a more repeatable, consistent, enjoyable experience, especially if you're making this a multi-user experience, which a lot of people are turning to us for, not just wanting one person at a time, but three, four, five. If you can think through some of those pieces, that will create a very repeatable, optimized VR experience of the model you're bringing in. Well said, AJ. Thank you. All right, next question we have from Alex Peters. Any experience with the VR sets from Varjo? You know, um, I know they're fantastic. Uh, I, I know they're absolutely fantastic. I personally have not had experience with them. But I think this also lends itself to just a great question I get all the time of, as an organization, what other headsets are you looking at supporting? And we at The Wild, we are very much customer driven. As we see organizations, our customer base start to deploy headsets, that really becomes our red flag of 
red flag's not the right way, but our North Star, oh, let's look at doing our own internal testing so that we can have it as another supported headset. So the Vive Focus 3 is a great example of that. As we're seeing more and more of our customers, that really kind of puts us in a spot of wanting that to be one of our supported. But the Varjo, as we start to see organizations embrace headsets more, that very well can uh, help us dictate how we can expand this list as well. Great answer. And just for context, for anyone curious on this call, what the Varjo is, it is one of the top of the line premium mixed reality headsets available. It's often used by really high end design, typically people who are working with digital twins, such as automotive design, where it's crucial to have mixed reality of scanning the environment, as well as incredibly high resolution. Right now, we're seeing in the AEC market, there's just not quite as much of a justification for the cost of this headset as some of these more affordable options are that we're presenting to you. But for anyone who's curious, it's out there and it's pretty cool. All right, thank you, Alex, for the question. Next one we have from Brian Oldages, I believe. Hey, Brian. Um, uh, how important is internal storage on the standalone headsets? 64 gigabytes up to 256 gigabytes. AJ, um, what, what do we need to take into consideration with storage space? It's really, you know, when I think about, you know, our, our respective uh, programs, you know, if you're just going to be using VR for a product like ours, you're going to be okay with the lower storage end. But it really comes down to, in a way, it connects back like the multi-device manager, and what are people going to be using it for? If you're deploying this as a business for specifically business use, maybe you only have one, two, three programs on there. In that case, you could probably get away with a headset that's going to be having lower storage. However, if you're an individual that's personally bought your headset and it's not just all business, it's also some leisure and fun you're probably going to be downloading some VR games, some Beat Saber, some other ones. You're going to be wanting to have hot larger storage. So the real question becomes of what apps, what things are we going to be using this headset for? How many things are we going to need to load on it? That might help you dictate what level of storage is appropriate. Thank you, AJ. Okay, next question from Rick Bertonsen, I believe. Have you looked at the MS HoloLens 2 for AR? Yes, yes. So um, AR, as I said, the, the star is most definitely something on our minds. I mean, we're really excited to see with the likes of Apple and as some of these other AR wearables come out that are truly more, more wear, wearable and practical. Um, the HoloLens is not you know, one of our supported headsets um, at this time, really namely because, and I, as I mentioned a moment ago, as being a customer driven organization, while I do see a spattering of HoloLens here and there, I don't see it very consistently. So in light of that, it hasn't um, proven beneficial for us to focus heavy support and testing on that front, but we are very, very much open-minded. And I truly do believe if we're having this conversation a year from now, uh, AR is gonna be a much bigger thought process of what options are available and how that relates back to our respective product offerings as well. Yes, well said. Okay, next question from autonomous, anonymous attendee. How well does the Vive Pro 2 799 model work? They did not see this on our list. Great question. We see this tripping some people up as well. The 799 model that you saw is the headset only. And that is an option for people who already have VR controllers as well as the base stations, but those are not included in that package. Those are essential in order to get into VR for most experiences. Um, so that's just something to take into consideration. The full price of $13.99 includes the controllers and the base stations. Great question. Next one from Michael Black. Has anyone compared the AirLink with the Quest 2 versus the Link cable? Are there any noticeable differences in quality? AJ, I have my own subjective experiences with this, but do you have any hard case studies or client experiences with this first? I'd say I'm a similar boat, Austin. Uh, my own just personal experiences. I've done, I've done both, and quite frankly, I've had great experiences on both. Um, with any technology where you're trying to use like Bluetooth, and connecting one device to the next, thus through the AirLink, 
I do feel there's more things that go wrong. Like I've had instances where it just won't sync to my computer. So the tether does, I think, give you a more level of comfort of you know having your cord and being right to it. But in terms of raw performance, when the air link is working well for me, which I want to be clear is more times than not, it is the same experience on as if I'm actually tethering it to my machine. But Austin, what's your your personal yeah. subjective experience been? Certainly more peace of mind being physically tethered using a cable. Uh, but the AirLink experience really does depend on your internet speed. That's something we can't emphasize enough is that it's highly recommended for you to have Wi-Fi 6, a potentially mesh system as well to make sure that both your computer and the headset are very close to your router. Uh, occasionally there is some stutter and lag if you do have a drop in connection there. But it is exciting to think of what the capabilities are both for wirelessly streaming through the internet and also the possibilities of cloud rendering down the road. And we also just want to reemphasize that the Pico Neo 3 Pro is also another great standalone headset that does have the ability to both wirelessly or physically tether for a very similar experience there. Most definitely. All right. I think we have time for one more here, AJ, from Ronald Coons. We're looking for examples of what other customers have done successfully with Oculus headset compared to higher end headsets, and then what they use to get there. Any client testimonies? Are there any quick quick riff case studies you can think of off the top of your head of the success of customers using the Quest versus some of the higher end? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, that, think for another question there, Ronald, there's a few very interesting things um, I've seen organizations do with, with the Quest. And I'll say even correlates to the, the Neo 3, that untethered option is they're really using it as a brand differentiation tool. And what I mean there is, they will gift the headset to their very, you know, blue chip VIP clients, send it out in a very nice uh, branded box, maybe a personal note from a member of your executive leadership team, and really saying, we feel this is a way that we can collaborate and deliver better work, have a better working relationship, and really, you know, gifting that through them or just using it through the tenure of the project. So when people go into that headset, the customers, you have done everything. You would have an app like ours, like Prospect or the Wild installed. So you've made it really kind of foolproof where they just need to put the goggles on, click on the app, and you would have the project that you're working on with them. And maybe you have a member of your team right when they log in there to you know, welcome them and really act as the proverbial uh, Sherpa or tour guide. So that has been a fantastic uh, brand differentiation piece. And the same token too, I'm seeing some amazing, amazing, amazing like charrettes in interview bid proposal client uh, design review um, uh, experiences that our customers are, are creating. The group over at, at Leo A Daily or BSA Life Structures have really maximized what you can do with just a little bit of forethought of how you bring a model into a VR experience. And it can become a very, very powerful one through the likes of a MetaQuest deal. And just to provide a little bit of hard data behind that question as well, we can share that we see the majority of users of both the Wild and Prospect do access through standalone devices like the MetaQuest 2 or the Pico Neo 3 Pro. Those options, as we mentioned, having the flexibility for both is really proving invaluable for teams making a hybrid consideration. Yes. All right, AJ, I think that does it with all of our questions. I love seeing all the great questions. Unfortunately, we can't get all, to all of them. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this with you later here. Uh, but I do want to say that we're so thankful to have you here with us today Absolutely. as people who are very curious to champion this technology at your firms. We know that there's a lot of resistance. We know that there's a lot of questions and we want to be here as your trusted consultants in this process. AJ, any closing thoughts on that note? No, I mean, echoing your, thank you so much for carving out the time. We know how hectic and chaotic life and work is, so we don't take that for granted. Hope that you got some great ideas from the session. Even though it's just one thing, we're going to very much consider that a success. Of course, that VR headset guide will be a part of our follow-up. And if you are at a point in your VR journey, as the pieces are coming together and you're really looking to bring these experiences to life, please contact us. You can try our products for free. Feel free to reach out to me personally. Even if you want to talk more about headsets or other considerations, we are connoisseurs of the industry and want to help you make the most confident decision so this can be a raving success with your team. So on that note, 
feel free to, uh, again, reach out to us in any form or fashion. And until next time, we wish you well. Have a good rest of your Friday, a good weekend, and we'll very much look forward to seeing you in the wild soon. And most importantly, have an excellent Pi Day, Monday, yes. 314. Of course, we will be celebrating at the Wild Full Company Holiday Off as one of the most important holidays to celebrate. Yes. <laughs> All right. Take care and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.